Hi, everybody. <laughs> so I'm here. I just it just occurred to me as I was driving in today. I'm in Washington D.C. and it's the last day of the Obama presidency, the last full day, because tomorrow, as we're shooting this, is inauguration day. And I'm here with my good friend Christy Winters, who I am hanging out with in person for the first time ever, which is awesome. Uh, she's in town for the inauguration and the Women's March on Saturday, uh, probably even more importantly. And uh, I'm going to be there too, and hopefully we'll have about a couple hundred thousand people. <laughs> Friends. There with us, yeah, friends, sisters, and brothers, and everybody else, and uh, it's going to be great. But today we wanted to talk about something that I think is going to be a very important issue moving forward, because here we are facing probably four years. Let's just plan on. Let's not plan on him being impeached. <laughs> let's plan on four years. Four years of a Trump administration, and we're we're already sort of seeing this phenomenon of people who voted for Trump for whatever reasons, and now they're having buyer's remorse. So we need to figure out how to reach out to those folks and talk to them in constructive ways so that we can get their help, not just for our selfish political benefit, but, but for what we think is the right direction to move the entire country, right? Right, because he's going to screw them over too. In fact, he, some of them he may screw them over worse mm -hmm. <laughs> than other people. I mean, well, that's the thing that I know we were talking about this earlier, that, you know, he, he got so much support from working class people. Yeah. And they're one of the most threatened groups mm -hmm. by, by the policies he's proposing. Right. You know? Yeah, he went in promising to drain the swamp. And I think he's got, what, five Goldman Sachs people already appointed, <laughs> a bunch of lawyer, uh, lobbyists, yeah. people who aren't qualified to run the departments. It's going to be a shit show. You know, um, and but yeah. it's not going to be the wealthy, wealthy and powerful who feel the effects of this of, on public education, on health care, uh, on the continuing uh, dilapidated transportation system. It's average working people who, as we're listening to them, as they're expressing their ideas, uh, or their their resent, their uh, sorry, their regrets or their doubts now about the fact that he told them one thing and they believed him. Yeah. And then immediately after he was elected, he started going back on his promises. There was a woman, you know, I think it was an article in Vox about a man who, or a person who saw him talking about his pursuit of Clinton. And during the campaign, it's, she's wrong, we're going to have an investigation, I'm going to appoint a special prosecutor. And literally within days of his election, he's like, oh, that was just talk for the campaign. You know, I don't yeah. actually believe any of that. And if you could say that about something that his crowds reacted to so intensely and churned them up, He's gonna be able. To, he's gonna say that about anything. Yeah. So when they inevitably become disillusioned and feel like he stabbed them in the back, my instinct will be to say, "I told you so. We told you he was a con man. We told you he was a liar." But as much as we want to say that, don't say that to them. Say it to friends. Right. Yeah. Say get it, it out. Get it out <laughs> in a safe space. Vented. Yeah. Vented among <laughs> yeah. among friends. But yeah, because they're not I, the enemy. Yeah, in, in fact, they, they they were duped. Yes, they were they were sold a bill of goods by a con man. By a con man who's done this his whole life. Yeah, his art of the deal. Yeah, is a con. And, I mean, and in in a sense, you know, I, I like there there is definitely a part of me, a very big loud part of me in my head that wants to do what you just said. That wants to be like, you know, oh, you people. It's too late, you know, like, where were you two months ago, you know? But then you, you have to stop and think that, you know, I mean, Trump specifically has been doing this for his entire professional life, and the Republican Party in general has been doing it for 50 years, at least, you know, at least this, this current iteration of Bait what they're doing, switch. you know? And, and lots of people have, 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 have believed them, have taken them at mm -hmm. their word. And that's just, that's just a terrible mistake to do that. And lots of us have done that. I mean, I, there are people I'm close to, people in my family, you know, who have voted against their direct personal interests many, many times because Republican politicians promised them that they knew how to make things better and that they would make things better for them. And so the, the, the challenge is to talk to people who have gone down that route without being condescending, without being a know-it-all, and without condemning them or, or blaming them, at least not too much, uh, and, and showing them that if, 
if they really care about like you know issues relating to working class people uh, wait, higher wages uh, you know vacation time paid sick leave uh, child leave uh, you know uh, basic things collective that, bargaining yeah. workers rights like that, that, that there's there's a, another place that you can go to and to not just like just vote for Democrats but you can have a voice in that party yeah and, and push that party to do those things because they're just more naturally philosophically oriented to do that kind of thing. Right, and you made the comment about it's not enough to just blindly vote for a party. Yeah. You yeah. have to demand the policies that will help you. That's the point of representation. It's the point of democracy. It's having someone who will speak for you in the halls of power. And a friend of mine talked about uh, just the other night about Tammy Baldwin. And someone asked whether it was really that important to have someone who was an, uh, an openly lesbian woman in Congress. And her point was, before I was there, people were talking about me. When I'm in the room, they're talking to me. Exactly. And working class people don't have a lot of representation in Congress. It's mostly millionaires and billionaires. So we need to make demands of the Democratic Party Absolutely. to actively represent working people, not just talk about their policies. But um, the f to get people there, first thing is we have to recognize that there will be a lot of buyer's remorse. Yes. And how people emotionally process a mistake we have a history in a recent history that people in 2001 were very much in favor of the Iraq war and over time lots of people changed their minds and decided it was a bad idea we had people who um, you know uh, were against marriage equality and then over time they changed their minds and the atheist community actually is really good at if somebody was a religious person and then realized that actually uh, I don't buy any of this I'm an atheist we're good at saying it doesn't matter what you thought before yes exactly. what matters is what you think now and we're gonna start from there and as much as it's emotionally satisfying uh, in a position where you, the election didn't go your way when people realize they've made a mistake to say I told you so yeah we really need to bite our tongues and not say that I think this time between the election result and the inauguration we could have our sour grapes yeah. We could have our little frustrations and being angry, but the moment he's sworn in, we need to focus on uniting together to defeat all of the bad policies yeah. we know are coming. And we can't do that if we're busy pointing fingers. So if someone says, I voted for Trump and I messed up, or I didn't vote and I messed up, just go, that's okay. What matters is what happens in the next election. So let's talk about the policies, you know, what do we need to stop in this Congress? What do we want to see instead? How do we get candidates that will support policies for paid yeah. sick leave, for paid vacation time, for parental leave, for workers' rights, for a living wage, things that will make a definitive improvement in people's lives and focus on the positive and taking things forward. I think it's, it's fine for us to have had our <laughs> bitterness and anger because it's emotional and we care about these things but we shouldn't cut off our nose to spite our yeah. face and I mean I, I do think I'm a big believer in, in in holding on to anger as motivation but I think yeah once once the inauguration takes place and we're in the Trump administration uh, that's where the anger has to be directed mm -hmm. and and it has to and it has to be directed and focused you can't just scream and yell and 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 just rage at the White House uh, you have to direct it toward constructive channels. And, you know, you brought up how the atheist community is good at sort of, you know, not holding a religious past against someone if they come to you and say, I've, I've become convinced that, you know, I'm an atheist now. And there's a really good analogy to be drawn there between how I, I I'll, I'll, sometimes for reasons that still kind of evade me, some, sometimes people will ask me, like, how do you how do you talk to religious folks or how do you argue with religious folks and i'm not all that great at that but what i tell people is what works for me is just ask people questions mm -hmm. and not not to trap them mm -hmm. and and not to to sort of find yourself an inroad into an argument but just to find out about them ask them because you're interested and because you want to know where they're coming from and what they think and and why they think what they think and you can do that with politics too if someone if you're in a conversation with someone who is a Trump voter and they're a little frustrated or they're feeling some remorse and they're thinking, I, uh, I can't believe I voted for that guy. Listen, listen, yeah. not talk, talk. Ask them what's important to them, yeah. exactly. Ask them what's, say, what's important to you? What, what, why did you vote for Trump? What did you hope would happen? What do you care about? What, what are you afraid of? What's, what, what do you hope will change in the future? 
and then you call on hopefully you're informed on the issues enough and you're informed on not not just specific policies that Democrats have uh, supported in the past or p specific pieces of legislation but but just the, the overall philosophy of the party and you can say okay if that's what's important to you mm -hmm. and you want to accomplish something in that area this is the direction that you should be pushing not over there because these people over there they don't actually care about you and that's not just an emotional response you can point to Look at, look at their priorities, look at the kinds of legislation that they support, look at the things that they have said that they want to do, and look at the historical results of when they have been able to enact those things. Look at the impact that it has had on people in your income bracket, for example. And then look at what has happened when more progressive policies have been put in place. So you don't just have to appeal to their emotions. You can do that if, if that is what they need to hear, and if, if, if a person is more receptive to that, but you can also just, you can call on facts and figures and say, if you care about the working class, then factually, objectively, it makes more sense to, to involve yourself in the Democratic Party and push Democrats to do progressive things. Because historically speaking, those are the policies mm -hmm. that are the most advantageous to working class people. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those are Democratic, yeah. you know, party policies. And I think the other thing too is, you know, you don't have to sign some up, someone up to the Democratic Party. Of course not. They can lobby, you know, they can write letters, they can do stuff. So, you know, I think the first inroad for somebody who's a disaffected Trump voter is to stop all the bad policies that the Republicans are putting forward. Yeah. You know, focus them on, and yourself, on specific actions. Legislative things that are coming up yeah. that you can write a letter to, exactly. you can do an email to, you can you can share things on social media uh, and become an expert on, it, on that issue that you care about. Or I tell them, you know, like, here's how you can help on this issue that you care about, or I could connect yeah. you up. Because, you know, it's, it's not like we're saying here we're recruiting for the Democratic Party. No. It's about um, gathering people who are like-minded with similar values and goals to get a policy policy outcome. And I think if, you know, eventually, uh, I would imagine that given the uh, legislation I expect to be coming from the Republican Congress, if people do get engaged because they're disappointed on Trump on issue A and B and C, there's going to be more after, there's yeah. going to be D, E, F, and G. So if you can rope people into not sort of like, all right, I hate on Republicans because I don't like <laughs> they're, they're the opposition party for right. me. But that doesn't mean I have to frame everything in that way. And we can talk about specific policy goals. And in fact, if someone is a Republican that you're talking to, they can use that to their advantage. That, that can be a source of power for them, especially if they have a Republican representative. Yeah, I voted be, Republican the exactly. last five elections. I'm really disappointed. I'm a lifelong Republican. I, and, you know, I, I don't see my interests being represented. You know, I don't understand why you supported this policy or this policy or this policy. Yeah. You know, I don't understand why, you know, I, I'm a Republican, but, you know, just for instance, I, I, I work with people who are children of immigrants. I don't understand why your policy is so hostile to people from, you know, from immigrant families. I don't understand why you're creating such a hostile environment for people who are, you know, of different sexual orientations or, 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 or are women or whatever. You know, if, if you have buyer's remorse for Trump because you feel like your party has left you behind because that you, you feel like that's not what you signed up for the Republican thing for, then let them know. Make your voice heard. Don't let the extremists in your own party speak for the party. You know, because then, because, hey, it, it would be great if the Republican Party actually did start caring about mm -hmm. working class people and actually working on practical solutions for problems that affect working class people or, 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 or marginalized folks because of their race or because of their, their gender or their, or their gender identity or their sexual orientation or whatever. I mean, if, if Republicans actually started to care about those issues instead of trying to sweep them under the rug or just sort of deflect, that would be great. You know, and maybe you can do something about that. But absolutely, you have to make your voice yeah. heard. I think in the next four years, we all have to own the responsibility of a democracy a bit more. It's easy to get on social media and tweet. It's easy to go on Facebook and complain. It's easy to have a gripe session yeah. with your friends. But we need to move beyond that into more direct activism, which is you know, um, contacting representatives 
uh, staying on top of this kind of news. We talked about over lunch the, the quote that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Yeah. Well, it's not just vigilance. You need to get off your butt. <laughs> and it's not just about watching, it's about being engaged. Yeah. And we have to, if we want a government that represents us, then we have to fight for it because we are seeing with gerrymandering, with voting suppression, with all of these tactics, again and again, they're trying to limit the ability of people, they're trying to destroy the idea of one person, one vote. Yeah. And there's only one way that we can overcome that gerrymandering. There's only one way that we can overcome the, having the table tilted against us. And that's getting more Republicans, getting more independents, getting more moderates to be willing to cross and to vote for Democrats who can counterbalance exactly. that power imbalance. And we can't do that by being angry and being bitter and and rubbing things, you know, being smug about people <laughs> realizing stuff that we figured out yeah. when he came down Stair Force One. You know, <laughs> yes, yeah. John. On and if, if and you know what, if if you you know if if you are talking to someone who is not comfortable supporting Democratic candidates or or, or, or switching parties or, or whatever, you know encourage them to look for Republican candidates in their primary elections mm -hmm. that are more, you know, uh, open to discussing these things. Because the, the primary process is, is again, is, is, is that part of our election that, relatively speaking, few people pay attention to. Yeah. And that's when... All the important decisions are made. All the important decisions are made. And especially on, on the... See, it's, the Democrats have the opposite problem. Republicans in the primaries is when the extremists assert mm -hmm. themselves and take control. And with Democrats, it's the opposite. With Democrats, it's, that's when the centrists take yeah. control. And uh, I, I mean, I'm not, I don't think that's as huge of a problem as some people do, but, but that's just what happens. Like the leftists in the Democratic Party have to fight for their voice and the representation during the primaries. And with Republicans, it's exactly the opposite. The last couple election cycles where the extremists, the Tea Party guys, are the ones that get all the attention and take up all the oxygen. And the more moderate or centrist Republicans uh, are the ones that kind of have to fight for air. And if you find yourself looking at the Trump version of the Republican Party and saying, that's not what I signed up for, then in two years in 2018, in four years in 2020, don't just look to the national election. Look to your representatives, look to your senator, look to your, your, your uh, people who are up for re-election at the state house level and your governorship and find people in your party that are more open to your point of view. And if they're not, then consider running. Yeah, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> you know, run for your city council. Absolutely. Run. If you care about these issues and you're not seeing the kind of representation that you want to see, if you don't think things are being uh, talked about, uh, things aren't being focused on, they're not going in the right direction, don't just look for somebody else. You know, sometimes the person who's the solution is the person looking back in the mirror. Yeah. And you just don't see them, that person in the role, see yourself in that role. If, what are you going to do? Stand for election. If you don't win, you haven't lost anything. Yeah, you, and and if you win, you can make a change. Yeah, and and even if you lose, you've at least you've you've taken a step. Mm -hmm. You've in, you've involved yourself in the process, and so that I, yeah, I think that's a big thing. If we as as progressive people want to reach out to people further to the right who voted for Trump who aren't happy, um, I, I think as much as possible, try to make it about a they were they were swindled, they were conned. But also, they 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 can be empowered by this. You know, this you can take this as an opportunity to say, okay, this it happened this time, but I won't let it happen again, and use it as motivation to involve themselves, whether it's in the Republican Party if that's where they feel at home, or the Democratic Party if if you can talk them into you know seeing that if they care about certain issues that it's it's just. It's just more practical to focus your efforts on, on Democrats than Republicans. Whatever, wh wherever you get them involved, um, get them involved and show them that that they can actually have a voice in this process, um, and and that there are practical ways to push for the things that they care about. Especially if you're talking about practical, like meat and potatoes, mm -hmm. economic issues. That is what they. That's what you hear every every election. It's the economy, stupid. Yeah. You hear that every single time. That's that's ultimately what people decide their vote on and you know it th those are issues that you can actually you can have something tangible you know it's not it's not a social issue where you know it, there are some people 
who, for whatever reasons, just don't feel connected to social issues. Just don't, don't, you know, they might think, oh, same-sex marriage, that's nice. Or same-sex marriage, I don't like that. But it doesn't move them one way or the other. But if you start talking about something that's going to affect their paycheck, then you've got them. And if you can show them that there are things that they can do to either push the Democratic Party to look out for people, to do a better job of looking out for people like them, which I agree they need to do a much better job of doing that, or maybe drag the Republican Party to actually caring about the people center. like them, which is a much longer drag. Mm, yes. <laughs> but but it's still, you know, it's... It's not over an ocean. It's, yeah. It's, you, you, <laughs> you, you could, in theory, be done. You could, you could do it, yeah. There, are, have, there have been moderate Republicans. Yeah, uh, once upon a time. Yes. Oh, children, let me tell you a story. <laughs> once upon a time. There were moderate Republicans. There were pro-choice Republicans. Yes. There were Republicans who voted for gun control, like the Brady Bill. There were Republicans who voted to raise taxes. Mm, yes. And, and Imagine that. And amnesty. And, oh, to illegal immigrants. Yes. And they were Ronald Reagan. <laughs> these, <yeah. laughs> these policies, yeah. The yeah. So yeah, it's it's possible, and and it's not it's not outside the realm of possibility of happening again. You know, but that's so. I think that should be sort of the the mm -hmm. primary message: is focus. Don't focus on blame, yeah. or or you know, raking up old graves, or dancing on yeah, <laughs> like some the Schadenfreude. Uh, like, yeah. ah, How's that show. Trump do it now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do that again. Do that, but in private. We'll, we'll do, do that, that amongst private. ourselves. Right. We'll have some. We'll have some private Google Hangouts <laughs> where it's just us. Nobody else is watching. Yes. Get it out of your system because it won't help, it won't convert a single person. It'll only make you feel good in the moment, but long-term, we need to bring people on board. And that's gotta be our goal. It's two years, four years, every election. And see, you actually have experience working in politics. I have no actual experience actually working on campaigns or working in offices, but I think we both have sort of seen, like, it's really frustrating to have to, to you know, to focus on that practical side sometimes because a lot of us are idealists and a lot of us have this vision of how things could be. And, and you focus on that. And when you realize that maybe you're not gonna get that mm -hmm. this time around, it can be a bitter pill to swallow. And you wanna shut down. To settle for whatever you can get. But that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. At least from where I, not everybody agrees with me, but that's what you have to do. You keep, keep pushing as hard as you can, but when you hit that wall and you can't push any further, then you have to stop pushing. You can't just stand there and kick the wall. Right. Like you have to. You have to figure out what what you do then. How you go forward. Exactly. There's a story. Um, I'm big. I just got into Hamilton. I'm a huge <laughs> Hamilton fan girl. But there was a story of Hamilton after the Battle of New York, where they had to flee from Brooklyn. Washington and his troops fled Brooklyn. They decided to stop uh, just outside of Harlem uh, and and stop there because the British weren't coming forward. And there's a story of George Washington walking through the troops, and most of the men were just devastated. They watched their home city being taken over by British troops, and they were crying, they were upset, and Ta Hamilton was digging in earthworks. He was just in the ground already, getting ready for the next battle. And Washington said, that's a guy I need to talk to. Yeah. Or somebody said this. And that's kind of like, yeah, there's a time for crying and feeling sorry for yourself, but that's not going to fix any of the problems. Um, it's you have to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, yeah. get back in the game, and uh, find a way forward in any way you can. And I, the other thing too that I think is important is that writing a, when you write a letter, that's not the end, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, here's a petition, I sign it, I've done something. No, I think you should get call every member of your state assembly, your state senate, your yeah. your congress offices, and get to know the names of the staffers who answer yes. those phones. Hey, Jerry, Sally, Manuel, whatever. Yeah. It's Christy again. I'm just calling to check on that bill. How's it coming along? Are you going to schedule a hearing shortly? We need to be more involved in our democratic processes. We have to watch these things and pay attention to them. It's not enough to just write a letter and go, oh, I've written one letter, yeah. therefore I should get the policy I want. Unfortunately, um, you know, democracy is going to take, I think, a lot more work in the next four years uh, to undo a lot of the damage mm -hmm. that we're going to see coming, and that's already been done. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, sort of direct democracy, which isn't really a thing in the United States, mm -hmm. but but direct action against your politicians or a direct mm -hmm. engagement. You know, voting didn't get the job done this time. So, I mean, the next chance we get to vote on a national level is two years. But in those intervening two years, that's when 
call your congressperson, call your senator, you know, write letters, go to, go to meetings, you know, organize, do, donate if you can, if you can afford it, you know, donate to your local parties or local... A, a or, group, an activist group that you care yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. A local, an environmental group or a labor group exactly, or whatever else. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and, and keep active. Don't just sit around and wait for the midterms. I mean, I think everybody needs to show up at the midterms. Yes. You know, but that's but the that's, end of a 24-month activism plan. Yeah, because, I mean, think about this, fellow progressive people. Um, the very first thing that the new Congress did when it got into town was start to repeal health care reform. That was the very first thing they did. And we're just at the very beginning. So it's going to take, it, it's going to be a very long two years. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a tooth and nail strug and struggle. For and for progressive, every bill is going to yeah. be ugly. Every bill is going to be horrific for us. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it, it, we have to, we, we have to stay involved and we can't just, you know, shake our heads and go, ah, oh, you know. I can't watch. I, I can't watch. I can't look. Like, that's a completely understandable <laughs> response. Mm -hmm. But that can't be all you do, you know. Like, I, I said this in a, in a video a couple a couple days ago, or maybe a week ago, like, that's, that's what got us into this mess. Yeah. That's not the only thing. There's a lot of stuff that went wrong this, this past election. Um, and it's not all the fault of progressives who didn't vote. Um, but that was part of it, that lack of, you know, well, I don't have to vote this time, mm -hmm. you know, or, well, Hillary's not perfect, so I'm not going to vote for anybody, you know. Like, there was a lot of that going on, and we sort of missed our shot, yeah. you know. And we don't get another shot electorally for two years, so we need to take the shots we can get we need in to the intervening years. We need to not throw away our shot. We need to not throw away our shot. Yeah, I didn't even plan it. <laughs> but it's true. This isn't. Um, I know. I know the instinct to turn away when bad news comes on, and I had a hard time watching the news after the election. That's fine. Take your time, mourn. <laughs> but um, if we don't face it down, and the other thing we have to realize as progressives is that we, uh, the table is tilted against us. We have yeah. to work twice as hard and get out twice as many voters just to break even, and it's not fair and it sucks. Yeah. But that's the situation we find ourselves in and unless we do the work to change it we're never going to change it and you yeah. can't count on other people to do it you have to look inside yourself and decide what you care about what you want to commit to and if it's 10 percent of your time a week that's fine but commit to actually doing something between now and every election yeah. you know for the next four years at least with the goal in mind because your work will make a difference it will add up over time you'll get more people to the polls you'll educate more people on issues you'll get more people who might have otherwise turned off of politics to stay engaged because you got them exactly. connected and you were their lifeline so be that person be the change yeah. that you want exactly. to see you know um Martin Luther King famously said that the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But here's the thing, you have to bend it. Yeah, it doesn't just happen <laughs> It doesn't itself. bend by itself. You have to bend it. And they handed, there's a lot of things we've been handed yeah. that have made our lives better, yeah. made me freer, made you freer, made a lot of people freer, but we can't rest on our laurels. No. It's gonna take work. There you go. I, you know, I understand why you don't live here, but I wish you would come here more often. <laughs> <laughs> this is so nice. I know, it's so nice to be in person rather than just sit on a hangout. Yeah, it's really great. But I'm glad that you're safe in Germany. Yes. Most of the time. With all my social benefits. <laughs> yeah, most of the time, yeah. <laughs> this has been, I'm glad we got it on camera. Yeah. It's been a fantastic opportunity to hang out. And, of course, we're going to be uh, vlogging the protest, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So this we won't be, be the only video. We will be at the, the Women's March. Saturday morning? On Saturday. And uh, I will show my political prop gag at the time, which has changed slightly from what I said on my channel. So I will <laughs> save the special Ooh. reveal to later. Okay. Something to come back for. I, yeah, the, hey, a cliffhanger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Bye, everyone. <laughs> that works. Yeah. Only 19, but my mind is older. These New York City streets get cold. I show to everybody. I have learned to manage. Underground is how wealthy streets famished.